Samuel de Champlain, French, Samuel de Place, born Samuel Champlain, on or before August 13, 1567 to December 25, 1635, known as the father of New France, was a French navigator, cartographer, draftsman, soldier, explorer, geographer, ethnologist, diplomat, and chronicler. He made from 21 to 29 trips across the Atlantic, and founded New France and Quebec City on July 3, 1608. He is important to Canadian history because he made the first accurate map of the coast and he helped found the settlements. Born into a family of wealthy mariners, Champlain, while still a young boy, began exploring North America in 1603 under the guidance of François Grave Dupont, his uncle. From 1604 to 1607, Champlain participated in the exploration and settlement of the first permanent European settlement north of Florida, Port Royal, Acadia, 1605, as well as the first European settlement that would become St. John, New Brunswick, 1604. Then, in 1608, he established the French settlement that is now Quebec City, Canada. Champlain was the first European to explore and describe the Great Lakes, and published maps of his journeys and accounts of what he learned from the natives and the French living among the natives. He formed relationships with local Montané and Innu and later with others farther west, Ottawa River, Lake Nipissing, or Georgian Bay, with Algonquin and with Huron Wendat, and agreed to provide assistance in the Beaver Wars against the Iroquois. In 1620, Louis XIII of France ordered Champlain to cease exploration, return to Quebec, and devote himself to the administration of the country. In every way but formal title, Samuel de Champlain served as governor of New France, a title that may have been formally unavailable to him owing to his non-noble status. He established trading companies that sent goods, primarily beaver fur, to France, and oversaw the growth of New France in the St. Lawrence River Valley until his death in 1635. Champlain is memorialized as the father of New France and father of Acadia, and many places, streets, and structures in northeastern North America bear his name, or have monuments established in his memory. The most notable of these is Lake Champlain, which straddles the border between northern New York and Vermont, extending slightly across the border into Canada. In 1609 he led an expedition up the Richelieu River and explored a long, narrow lake situated between the Green Mountains of present-day Vermont and the Adirondack Mountains of present-day New York. He named the lake after himself as the first European to map and describe it. Birth year, location and family Champlain was born to Antoine Champlain, also written Antoine Chapelain in some records, and Marguerite Le Roy, in either Hears Brouage, or the port city of La Rochelle, in the French province of Annas. He was born on or before August 13, 1574, according to a recent baptism record found by Jean-Marie Germ, French genealogist. Although in 1870, the Canadian Catholic priest Levertier, in the first chapter of his Herves de Champlain, accepted Pierre Damien Rengay. S estimate and tried to justify it, his calculations were based on assumptions now believed, or proven, to be incorrect. Although Le Pold de Layant, member, secretary, then president of L. Académie des Belles Lettres, Sciences et Arts de la Rochelle, wrote as early as 1867 that Rengay's estimate was wrong. The books of Rengay and Libertier have had a significant influence. The 1567 date was carved on numerous monuments dedicated to Champlain and is widely regarded as accurate. In the first half of the 20th century, some authors disagreed, choosing 1570 or 1575 instead of 1567. In 1978 Jean Liebel published groundbreaking research about these estimates of Champlain's birth year and concluded. Samuel Champlain was born about 1580 in Brouage, France. Liebel asserts that some authors, including the Catholic priests Rengay and Lavertier, preferred years when Brouage was under Catholic control, which include 1567, 1570, and 1575. Champlain claimed to be from Brouage in the title of his 1603 book and to be saint Angeois in the title of his second book, 1613. He belonged to either a Protestant family, or a tolerant Roman Catholic one, since Brouage was most of the time a Catholic city in a Protestant region, and his Old Testament first name, Samuel, was not usually given to Catholic children. 
The exact location of his birth is thus also not known with certainty, but at the time of his birth his parents were living in Bruaje. Born into a family of mariners, both his father and uncle-in-law were sailors, or navigators, Samuel Champlain learned to navigate, draw, make nautical charts, and write practical reports. His education did not include ancient Greek or Latin, so he did not read or learn from any ancient literature. As each French fleet had to assure its own defense at sea, Champlain sought to learn to fight with the firearms of his time. He acquired this practical knowledge when serving with the army of King Henry IV during the later stages of France. S. Religious wars in Brittany from 1594 or 1595 to 1598, beginning as a quartermaster responsible for the feeding and care of horses. During this time he claimed to go on a certain secret voyage for the king, and saw combat, including maybe the siege of Fort Crozen, at the end of 1594. By 1597 he was a Capitaine d. Un Company, serving in a garrison near Campere. Early travels In 1598, his uncle-in-law, a navigator whose ship St. Julian was chartered to transport Spanish troops to Cadiz pursuant to the Treaty of Bourbons, gave Champlain the opportunity to accompany him. After a difficult passage, he spent some time in Cadiz before his uncle, whose ship was then chartered to accompany a large Spanish fleet to the West Indies, again offered him a place on the ship. His uncle, who gave command of the ship to Geronimo de Valabrera, instructed the young Champlain to watch over the ship. This journey lasted two years, and gave Champlain the opportunity to see or hear about Spanish holdings from the Caribbean to Mexico City. Along the way, he took detailed notes, and wrote an illustrated report on what he learned on this trip, and gave this secret report to King Henry, who rewarded Champlain with an annual pension. This report was published for the first time in 1870, by Lavertier, as Brief Discours des Choses plus Remarquables K. Samuel Champlain de Bruage a Ricanes aux Indies Occidentals au Voyage Coup. Il n'a fait en nl. Anne 1599 et nl. Anne 1601, Come on Sweet, and in English as Narrative of a Voyage to the West Indies and Mexico 1599-1602. The authenticity of this account as a work written by Champlain has frequently been questioned, due to inaccuracies and discrepancies with other sources on a number of points, however, recent scholarship indicates that the work probably was authored by Champlain, on Champlain. S. returned to Cadiz in August 1600, his uncle, who had fallen ill, asked him to look after his business affairs. This Champlain did, and when his uncle died in June 1601, Champlain inherited his substantial estate. It included an estate near La Rochelle, commercial properties in Spain, and a 150-ton merchant ship. This inheritance, combined with the king's annual pension, gave the young explorer a great deal of independence, as he was not dependent on the financial backing of merchants and other investors. From 1601 to 1603 Champlain served as a geographer in the court of King Henry IV. As part of his duties he traveled to French ports and learned much about North America from the fishermen that seasonally traveled to coastal areas from Nantucket to Newfoundland to capitalize on the rich fishing grounds there. He also made a study of previous French failures at colonization in the area, including that of Pierre de Chauvin at Tadouzic. When Chauvin forfeited his monopoly on fur trade in North America in 1602, responsibility for renewing the trade was given to Amar de Chaste. Champlain approached de Chaste about a position on the first voyage, which he received with the king's assent. Champlain's first trip to North America was as an observer on a fur trading expedition led by Francois Grave Dupont. Dupont was a navigator and merchant who had been a ship's captain on Chauvin's expedition, and with whom Champlain established a firm lifelong friendship. He educated Champlain about navigation in North America, including the St. Lawrence River, and in dealing with the natives there, and in Acadia after. The Bon Renommé the Good Fame, arrived at Tadouzic on March 15, 1603. 
Champlain was anxious to see for himself all of the places that Jacques Cartier had seen and described about 60 years earlier, and wanted to go even further than Cartier, if possible. Champlain created a map of the St. Lawrence on this trip and, after his return to France on September 20, published an account as Des Sauvages, au voyage de Samuel Champlain, de Bruages, Fête en la France Nouvelle L. in 1603. Concerning the savages, or travels of Samuel Champlain of Bruages, made in New France in the year 1603. Included in his account were meetings with Bigorot, a chief of the Montané at Tadouzic, in which positive relationships were established between the French and the many Montané gathered there, with some Algonquin friends. Promising to King Henry to report on further discoveries, Champlain joined a second expedition to New France in the spring of 1604. This trip, once again an exploratory journey without women and children, lasted several years, and focused on areas south of the St. Lawrence River, in what later became known as Acadia. It was led by Pierre Dubois de Mons, a noble and Protestant merchant who had been given a fur trading monopoly in New France by the king. Dubois asked Champlain to find a site for winter settlement. After exploring possible sites in the Bay of Fundy, Champlain selected St. Croix Island in the St. Croix River as the site of the expedition's first winter settlement. After enduring a harsh winter on the island the settlement was relocated across the bay where they established Port Royal. Until 1607, Champlain used that site as his base, while he explored the Atlantic coast. Dubois was forced to leave the settlement for France in September 1605, because he learned that his monopoly was at risk. His monopoly was rescinded by the king in July 1607 under pressure from other merchants and proponents of free trade, leading to the abandonment of the settlement. In 1605 and 1606, Champlain explored the North American coast as far south as Cape Cod, searching for sites for a permanent settlement. Minor skirmishes with the resident Nossets dissuaded him from the idea of establishing one near present-day Chatham, Massachusetts. He named the area Malabar. Bad Bar Founding of Quebec City In the spring of 1608, Dubois wanted Champlain to start a new French colony and fur trading center on the shores of the St. Lawrence. Dubois equipped, at his own expense, a fleet of three ships with workers, that left the French port of Honfleur. The main ship, called the Don de Dieu, French for the gift of God, was commanded by Champlain. Another ship, the Livrier, the Hunt Dog, was commanded by his friend Dupont. The small group of male settlers arrived at Tadouzic on the lower St. Lawrence in June. Because of the dangerous strength of the Saguenay River ending there, they left the ships and continued up the Big River in small boats bringing the men and the materials. On July 3, 1608, Champlain landed at the Point of Quebec and set about fortifying the area by the erection of three main wooden buildings, each two stories tall, that he collectively called the habitation, with a wooden stockade and a moat 12 feet 4 meters wide surrounding them. This was the very beginning of Quebec City. Gardening, exploring, and fortifying this place became great passions of Champlain for the rest of his life. In the 1620s, the habitation at Quebec was mainly a store for the Company des Marchands, Traders Company, and Champlain lived in the wooden Fort St. Louis newly built up the hill, south from the present-day Chateau Frontenac Hotel, near the only two houses built by the two settler families, the ones of Louis Hebert and Guillaume Quillard, his son-in-law. Murder of the King in May 1610, King Henry was assassinated in Paris by a Catholic fanatic, and rule fell to his wife, Marie de Medici, as regent for the nine-year-old Louis XIII. Marie was a staunch Catholic with little interest in New France, and many of Champlain. S. Protestant financial supporters, including Pierre Dubois de Mons, were denied access to court. Champlain, on hearing the news, returned to France in September 1610 to establish new political connections in support of efforts at colonization. Marriage One route Champlain may have chosen to improve his access to the court of the regent was his decision to enter into marriage with the 12-year-old Hélène Boulay. She was the daughter of Nicolas Boulay, a man charged with carrying out royal decisions at court. 
The marriage contract was signed on December 27, 1610 in presence of Dugua, who had dealt with the father, and the couple was married three days later. The terms of the contract called for the marriage to be consummated two years later. Champlain sought permission from her parents to consummate the marriage before that. Many of those who entered into such relationships, such as Samuel de Champlain d. 1635, the first governor of French Canada, agreed that they would not have sex with a 12-year-old bride until she was 14, as Champlain did unless he consulted with her family and received their permission to do so earlier. Apparently, he did. Champlain's marriage was initially quite troubled, as Hélène rallied against joining him in August 1613. Their relationship, while it apparently lacked any physical connection, recovered and was apparently good for many years. Hélène lived in Quebec for several years, but returned to Paris and eventually decided to enter a convent. The couple had no children, although Champlain did adopt three Montanay girls named Faith, Hope, and Charity in the winter of 1627-28. Relations and war with indigenous peoples During the summer of 1609, Champlain attempted to form better relations with the local native tribes. He made alliances with the Wendat called Huron by the French, and with the Algonquin, the Montanay and the Etchemin, who lived in the area of the St. Lawrence River. These tribes demanded that Champlain help them in their war against the Iroquois, who lived farther south. Champlain set off with nine French soldiers and 300 natives to explore the Rivière des Iroquois, now known as the Richelieu River, and became the first European to map Lake Champlain. Having had no encounters with the Iroquois at this point many of the men headed back, leaving Champlain with only two Frenchmen and 60 natives. On July 29, somewhere in the area near Ticonderoga and Crown Point, New York, historians are not sure which of these two places, but Fort Ticonderoga historians claim that it occurred near its site, Champlain and his party encountered a group of Iroquois. In a battle begun the next day, 200 Iroquois advanced on Champlain's position, and one of his guides pointed out the three Iroquois chiefs. In his account of the battle, Champlain recounts firing his arquebus and killing two of them with a single shot, after which one of his men killed the third. The Iroquois turned and fled. This action set the tone for poor French Iroquois relations for the rest of the century. The Battle of Sorel occurred on June 19, 1610, with Samuel de Champlain supported by the Kingdom of France and his allies, the Wyandot people, Algonquin people, and Innu people against the Mohawk people in New France at present day Sorel Tracy, Quebec. The forces of Champlain armed with the arquebus engaged and killed or captured nearly all of the Mohawks. The battle ended major hostilities with the Mohawks for 20 years. Exploration of New France On March 29, 1613, arriving back in New France, he first ensured that his new royal commission be proclaimed. Champlain set out on May 27 to continue his exploration of the Huron country and in hopes of finding the Northern Sea. He had heard about probably Hudson Bay. He traveled the Ottawa River, later giving the first description of this area. Along the way, he apparently dropped or left behind a cache of silver cups, copper kettles, and a brass astrolabe dated 1603. Champlain's astrolabe, which was later found by a farm boy named Edward Lee near Cobden, Ontario. It was in June that he met with Tesuat, the Algonquin chief of Olomets Island, and offered to build the tribe a fort if they were to move from the area they occupied, with its poor soil, to the locality of the Lachine Rapids. By August 26, Champlain was back in St. Malo. There, he wrote an account of his life from 1604 to 1612 and his journey up the Ottawa River, his voyages, and published another map of New France. In 1614, he formed the Company des Marchands de Rouen et de Saint Malo, and Company de Champlain, which bound the Rouen and Saint Malo merchants for eleven years. He returned to New France in the spring of 1615 with four recollects in order to further religious life in the new colony. The Roman Catholic Church was eventually given and seigneury large and valuable tracts of land, estimated at nearly 30% of all the lands granted by the French crown in New France. Champlain continued to work to improve relations with the natives, promising to help them in their struggles against the Iroquois. With his native guides, he explored further up the Ottawa River and reached Lake Nipissing. 
He then followed the French River until he reached the freshwater sea he called Lac Atigauautau, now Lake Huron. In 1615, Champlain was escorted through the area that is now Peterborough, Ontario by a group of Hurons. He used the ancient portage between Kemung Lake and Little Lake now Kemung Road, and stayed for a short period of time near what is now Bridge North. Military expedition On September 1, 1615, at Cahiagüe, a Huron community on what is now called Lake Simcoe, he and the northern tribes started a military expedition against the Iroquois. The party passed Lake Ontario at its eastern tip where they hid their canoes and continued their journey by land. They followed the Oneida River until they arrived at the main Onondaga Fort on October 10. The exact location of this place is still a matter of debate. Although the traditional location, Nichols Pond, is regularly disproved by professional and amateur archaeologists, many still claim that Nichols Pond is the location of the battle. 10 miles 16 kilometers south of Canastota, New York. Champlain attacked the stockaded Oneida Indian village. He was accompanied by 10 Frenchmen and 300 Huron Indians. Pressured by the Hurons to attack prematurely, the assault failed. Champlain was wounded twice in the leg by arrows, one in his knee. The conflict ended on October 16 when the French and Huron were forced to flee. Although he did not want to, the Hurons insisted that Champlain spend the winter with them. During his stay, he set off with them in their great deer hunt, during which he became lost and was forced to wander for three days living off game and sleeping under trees until he met up with a band of aboriginals by chance. He spent the rest of the winter learning their country, their manners, customs, modes of life. On May 22, 1616, he left the Huron country and returned to Quebec before heading back to France on July 2. Improving administration in New France Champlain returned to New France in 1620 and was to spend the rest of his life focusing on administration of the territory rather than exploration. Champlain spent the winter building Fort St. Louis on top of Cape Diamond. By mid-May, he learned that the fur trading monopoly had been handed over to another company led by the Kahn brothers. After some tense negotiations, it was decided to merge the two companies under the direction of the Kahn's. Champlain continued to work on relations with the natives and managed to impose on them a chief of his choice. He also negotiated a peace treaty with the Iroquois. Champlain continued to work on the fortifications of what became Quebec City, laying the first stone on May 6, 1624. On August 15 he once again returned to France where he was encouraged to continue his work as well as to continue looking for a passage to China, something widely believed to exist at the time. By July 5 he was back at Quebec and continued expanding the city. In 1627 the Khan brothers company lost its monopoly on the fur trade, and Cardinal Richelieu, who had joined the Royal Council in 1624 and rose rapidly to a position of dominance in French politics that he would hold until his death in 1642, formed the Company des Cent Associés, the Hundred Associates, to manage the fur trade. Champlain was one of the 100 investors, and its first fleet, loaded with colonists and supplies, set sail in April 1628. Champlain had overwintered in Quebec. Supplies were low, and English merchants pillaged Cap Tormente in early July 1628. A war had broken out between France and England, and Charles I of England had issued letters of marque that authorized the capture of French shipping and its colonies in North America. Champlain received a summons to surrender on July 10 from some heavily armed, English-based Scottish merchants, the Kirk brothers. Champlain refused to deal with them, misleading them to believe that Quebec S defenses were better than they actually were. Champlain had only 50 pounds of gunpowder to defend the community. Successfully bluffed, they withdrew, but encountered and captured the French supply fleet, cutting off that year's supplies to the colony. By the spring of 1629, supplies were dangerously low, and Champlain was forced to send people to Gaspé and into Indian communities to conserve rations. On July 19, the Kirk brothers arrived before Quebec after intercepting Champlain's plea for help, and Champlain was forced to surrender the colony. 
Many colonists were taken first to England and then to France by the Kirks, but Champlain remained in London to begin the process of regaining the colony. A peace treaty had been signed in April 1629, three months before the surrender, and, under the terms of that treaty, Quebec and other prizes were taken by the Kirks after the treaty was supposed to be returned. It was not until the 1632 Treaty of Saint Germain en Laye that Quebec was formally given back to France. David Kirk was rewarded when Charles I knighted him and gave him a charter for Newfoundland. Champlain reclaimed his role as commander of New France on behalf of Richelieu on March 1, 1633, having served in the intervening years as commander in New France. In the absence of my lord the Cardinal de Richelieu. From 1629 to 1635. In 1632 Champlain published Voyages de la Nouvelle France, which was dedicated to Cardinal Richelieu, and Traité de la Marine et du Devoir d'une bonne marinière, a treatise on leadership, seamanship, and navigation. Champlain made more than 25 round-trip crossings of the Atlantic in his lifetime, without losing a single ship. Last return, and last years working in Quebec Champlain returned to Quebec on May 22, 1633, after an absence of four years. Richelieu gave him a commission as Lieutenant General of New France, along with other titles and responsibilities, but not that of Governor. Despite this lack of formal status, many colonists, French merchants, and Indians treated him as if he had the title, writings survive in which he is referred to as our Governor. On August 18, 1634, he sent a report to Richelieu stating that he had rebuilt on the ruins of Quebec, enlarged its fortifications, and established two more habitations. One was 15 leagues upstream, and the other was at Trois-Rivières. He also began an offensive against the Iroquois, reporting that he wanted them either wiped out or brought to reason. Death and burial Champlain had a severe stroke in October 1635, and died on December 25, leaving no immediate heirs. Jesuit records state he died in the care of his friend and confessor Charles Lailment, although his will, drafted in November 17, 1635, gave much of his French property to his wife Hélène, he made significant bequests to the Catholic missions and to individuals in the colony of Quebec. However, Marie Camaret, a cousin on his mother, S. Side challenged the will in Paris and had it successfully overturned. It is unclear exactly what happened to his estate. Samuel de Champlain was temporarily buried in the church while a standalone chapel was built to hold his remains in the upper part of the city. Unfortunately, this small building, along with many others, was destroyed by a large fire in 1640. Though immediately rebuilt, no traces of it exist anymore. His exact burial site is still unknown, despite much research since about 1850, including several archaeological digs in the city. There is general agreement that the previous Champlain Chapel site, and the remains of Champlain, should be somewhere near the Notre Dame de Quebec Cathedral. The search for Champlain S. Remains supplies a key plot line in the crime writer Luis Penny's 2010 novel, Bury Your Dead. Memorials Many sites and landmarks have been named to honor Champlain, who remains, to this day, a prominent historical figure in many parts of Acadia, Ontario, Quebec, New York, and Vermont. They include Lake Champlain, Champlain Valley, the Champlain Trail Lakes. Champlain Sea, a past inlet of the Atlantic Ocean in North America, over the St. Lawrence, the Saguenay, and the Richelieu Rivers, to over Lake Champlain, which inlet disappeared many thousands years before Champlain was born. Champlain Mountain, Acadia National Park, which he first observed in 1604. A town and village in New York, as well as a township in Ontario and a municipality in Quebec. The Provincial Electoral District of Champlain, Quebec, and several defunct electoral districts elsewhere in Canada. Samuel de Champlain Provincial Park, a provincial park in northern Ontario near the town of Mattawa. Champlain Bridge, which connects the island of Montreal to Brassard, Quebec across the St. Lawrence. Champlain Bridge, which connects the cities of Ottawa, Ontario and Gatineau, Quebec. 
Champlain College, one of six colleges at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, is named in his honor. Fort Champlain, a dormitory at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario, named in his honor in 1965, it houses the 10th Cadet Squadron. A French school in St. John, New Brunswick, École Champlain, an elementary school in Moncton, New Brunswick, Champlain College, in Burlington, Vermont, and Champlain Regional College, a CEGEP with three campuses in Quebec. Marriott Chateau Champlain Hotel, in Montreal. Streets named Champlain in numerous cities, including Quebec, Shawinigan, the city of Dieppe in the province of New Brunswick, in Plattsburgh, and no less than 11 communities in northwestern Vermont. A memorial statue on Cumberland Avenue in Plattsburgh, New York on the shores of Lake Champlain in a park named for Champlain. A memorial statue in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada in Queen Square that commemorates his discovery of the St. John River. A memorial statue in Isle La Motte, Vermont, on the shore of Lake Champlain. The lighthouse at Crown Point, New York features a statue of Champlain by Carl Augustus Eber. A commemorative stamp issue in May 2006 jointly by the United States Postal Service and Canada Post. A statue in Ticonderoga, New York, unveiled in 2009 to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Champlain's exploration of Lake Champlain. A statue in Orillia, Ontario at Cauchiching Beach Park on Lake Cauchiching. HMCS Champlain, 1919, AS class destroyer that served in the Royal Canadian Navy from 1928 to 1936. HMCS Champlain, a Canadian Forces Naval Reserve Division based in Chicoutimi, Quebec since activation in 1985. Champlain Place, a shopping centre located in Dieppe, New Brunswick, Canada. The Champlain Society, a Canadian historical and text publication society, chartered in 1927. Bibliography these are works that were written by Champlain. Brief Discours des Choses plus Remarquables K. Samuel Champlain de Brouage a Ricanias aux Indies Occidentals au Voyage Coup. Il n'a fait n'i sets n l. Anne 1599 et n l'année 1601. Come on sweet. First French publication 1870. First English publication 1859 as narrative of a voyage to the West Indies and Mexico 1599-1602. Des Sauvages, O Voyage de Samuel Champlain, de Bruages, Fête en la France Nouvelle Land 1603, first French publication 1604, first English publication 1625. Voyages de la Nouvelle France, first French publication 1632. Traité de la Marine et du Devoir d'une bonne marinière, first French publication, 1632. Notes and references. Notes. Citations. References. Further reading. External links. Works by Samuel de Champlain at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Samuel de Champlain at Internet Archive From Marcel Trudel, Champlain, Samuel de, at the Canadian Encyclopedia Champlain in Acadia Biography at the Museum of Civilization Samuel de Champlain Biography by Appleton and Kloss Description of Champlain's voyage to Chatham, Cape Cod in 1605 and 1606. They didn't name that lake for nothing. Sunday Book Review, The New York Times, October 31, 2008. Dead Reckoning, Champlain in America, PBS Documentary 2009. World Digital Library Presentation of Description des Costs. PTS, Raids, Isles de la Nouvelle France Fay Excellent Sun Bray Maridiner Description of the Coasts, Points, Harbors and Islands of New France
Library of Congress. Primary source Portalon style chart on vellum with summary description, image with enhanced view and zoom features, text to speech capability. French. Links to related content. Content available as TIFF. One of the major cartographic resources, this map offers the first thorough delineation of the New England and Canadian coasts from Cape Sable to Cape Cod. A book from 1603 of Champlain's first voyage to New France from the World Digital Library. In French, Champlain's tomb, state-of-the-art inquiry. In French, from Samuel de Champlain, Les Voyages de la Nouvelle France. 1632, at Rare Book Room. In French, Baptismal Parish Register, August 13, 1574, Protestant Temple Saint. Jan, La Rochelle.